first week we talked about three women. <clears throat> a woman who had walked into a church and she um, was welcomed, but, uh, but the, the people that were talking to her, the members um, seemed to say, things seem like they're dying here. And um, they really didn't know who she was and what she was about. And within th three years, this church was alive. It was booming. And of course, the, the, the story there is that <clears throat> here's a woman who actually prayed, and there was a vision. Uh, there was a vision, and, and God heard that uh, cry. Mary then um, was there at a wedding, and of course, you know the story. They ran out of wine, and Mary said to Jesus, would you do, would you do something for us? And, and Jesus said, no, uh, it's not my time. Mary turns to the, to the uh, people that are serving and says, do whatever he says. And as you remember and you recall that um, the water turned to wine. And then finally, uh, the first night we, we talked about, uh, we witnessed this Greek woman who had nothing but obstacles and and what, we're t what she demonstrated for us that she would not take no for an answer. And, and, the, and the meaning to all of that is, is that how often do we pray like that? How often do we pray as if we expect an answer and we're not going to give up until we hear God's answer? And so <clears throat> those are all kind of the preliminary stories to prayer. Last week, uh, if you can recall... We were, there's this man, this man who had a guest come to visit him. And at midnight, um, he realized he was out of bread. No, nothing to feed his guest. And so he went next door and he started knocking. And if you, re if you remember that his, the answer that he got was, go away. Don't you, can't you tell I'm asleep? Um, I'm in bed with my children. There's no way I'm getting out of bed. And the man, of course, said, well, if you want to sleep at all tonight, you'll be getting out of bed and you'll be giving me what I want. Well, it's kind of <clears throat> unusual when you think about that Jesus told that story and he's telling us <clears throat> that just keep going and keep going until you, until you get the answer. So we're sort of witnessing... Um, a, from across the street, all of these different various people. We're watching them, we're sort of taking clues from them, we're trying to gather what's, what's behind all this, why is this, why is this what it is? <clears throat> and so we're sort of uh, approaching these people from a distance. But tonight, we're gonna turn the light on ourselves. And we're going to begin to explore some of the ideas that may be behind why God isn't hearing our prayers. And so um, tonight's topic is called The Door of Disenchantment. Anybody ever, anybody ever heard that of that word? Not really, no. Not really. Okay. So I decided that before we get deep into this story, that we ought to talk about what disenchantment means. And I don't... Is it, is, Disenchantment. So I decided that <clears throat> we don't want to use a word that nobody seems to understand. I don't know if you can read that. Can you read that? Yeah. It's disappointment a lot more. I mean, a lot better for us to learn English. Because uh, disenchantment, I cannot even translate, but disappointment, which mm -hmm. would be the cousin probably of disenchantment. Yes. Uh, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, it's a feeling of disappointment. It's a feeling of what? A disappointment about someone or something you previously thought. Uh, ex, ex, what does that say? Respected. Oh, the, somebody you personally or you previously respected or admired. Now, I may be the only person in this room that's ever had that experience, but. What that's really saying is you meet somebody and you think certain things about them <clears throat> and it turns out to not be true. 
Now, I can, I can, pro- I mean, I, by the smiles on the faces that I'm looking at, then you've all experienced that. Okay, so let's talk, now that's, so that's, we become, we become disenchanted. Um, and so at the next slide, so what is enchantment? Johnny, can you read that? No, I need my glasses. Okay. Our first impressions may... Say it one more time. Our first impressions may enchant us until we... Enchantment. Our first impressions may enchant us until we find out what something is all about. A feeling of great pleasure or delight, almost as if we were under a spell. Okay. So, keep that in mind as we head into this, into this session, because... It's going to, now that you know what that means, there's going to be a light that shines on this particular word, and it will mean more as we get into this. Okay, so the door of disenchantment. From Hosea, 10th chapter, verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain salvation upon you. Break up your fallow ground. None of us are farmers. Maybe some of us are gardeners. But uh, Hosea, uh, the, the children of Israel went a whole, they were in a lot of trouble. Um, They had turned their backs on God. And Hosea the prophet is saying to them um, that it's time for them to make a change in their life. And so he uses this word, uh, break up your fallow ground. Um, Break up the fallow ground, those idle fields that haven't produced anything in years, where the soil is hard and crusted and sour. We're really talking about people. Um, we're, we're, not talking, we're, we're not talking about the dirt out there, but that's, that is what the illustration is about. We're talking about parts of our lives that are just sitting fallow, that God is not using and we're not using properly. For most of us, the only time anything happens to this fa- fallow ground in our lives is when it's broken up for us. We're sliding along in our comfortable rut, knowing very well that we're not even half alive, but too comfortable to do anything about it until a crisis of some kind comes crashing in. Our routine is seriously jolted. What could that be? A loss of a friendship, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job. Any circumstances that set us back. And what we're talking about here is that it's those things that that usher us into making changes because we have to. So in, in the process of dealing with these crises, The fallow ground in our lives is broken up. Things start growing there for the first time in years. Am I tracking? Do do people know what I'm talking about? When when something happens in our life that we didn't expect and we didn't know it was going to happen, it shakes us up. uh, First page. Turn the page over. I'm still in the first column. You see it, right? It's on the, le- on the left side of that first page. Okay. Okay. Okay, so here's, here's, um, 
here's what's going on. There's parts of our lives that aren't, we're not using, we're not, we're, we're not effective. There's things that are going on, but we don't really make changes until something happens to us. And then all of a sudden we wake up and we go, oh my goodness, how did this happen? How, how, and we become very surprised. So here's a few examples uh, that we're going to get into. So sometimes a husband and wife, and I know this isn't true in Romanian churches, <laughs> uh, but, but they live side by side without one harsh word. Um, they have their dull resentments. Um, their secret forms of self-pity. And you just let me know if I'm hitting too close to home because I have lived this life, so I'm telling you, I understand this. Okay, they escape in fantasies. They watch TV, they do different things, they don't do things together. But life drones on. And the result of that is there are certain things that happen when we don't address the issues and we, and we actually put up walls. We, we become bitter. Possibly we, we, we become bitter. Uh, we resent other people. Uh, we live in this sort of world of unresolved issues. And so uh, the story here is really those things become follow ground in our life. Whenever we're bitter, whenever we're angry, spend time being angry, whenever we live in a world where things aren't resolved between people and situations that we're, we're involved, then potentially those things become um, fallow ground in our life. And then one day, this apathetic union is jolted and the resentments come pouring out. We could call that an argument. <laughs> I think you'd understand that. The hidden bitterness rises to the surface. The marriage itself is called into question. And in the process, the fallow ground is broken up. At least there's a fresh air and new life in that home. You know, if you've ever, if you've ever been told, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about that. You know, you want to talk about something and people say, well, I don't want to talk about that. Well, those are parts of this sort of ignoring what, what God, I think, is talking to us about here, which is uh, making, making ourselves available to to be fertile in terms of our ground being broken up. This is especially true when it comes to prayer. For many of us, our prayer life is follow ground. We say the same thing over and over again, and, and it becomes more routine than it becomes relational. And so uh, if, if you go on and on and on, uh, your prayers become dry. They become hard. They become barren until... One day, we become disenchanted. That's the word. We've had enough. We wake up and we see how sad and useless and pitiful are our tepid prayers. What caused this disenchantment? What caused this? God? Did he, did he cause that? That's right. The crisis caused it. And so we become disenchanted. But, it is God, but is it God's responsibility to break up our fallow ground for us? Is it? Is, is God supposed to go, come around cleaning up our messes, breaking up the fallow ground? Uh, do we have a right to expect God to be our alarm clock when we keep rolling over and going back to sleep? How do you view God? The Lord has been extremely good to us. He has broken our fallow ground again and again, but clearly God's desire is that we should grow up and start taking care of this matter ourselves. When you were a small child, your mother woke you up in the morning. Remember? But when you grow up, you wake yourself up, and you make your own breakfast. A lot of this <laughs> um, is developmental. So the passage in Hosea says, don't wait for the circumstances to do it for you. You break up 
you follow ground. You stir up the gift that is within you. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain salvation upon you. Seek the Lord. Pray. Pray for real. And pray for zeal. Now here's a few examples of people who are doing something or did something. You remember Zacchaeus. All the kids, the kids' story about Zacchaeus. He climbed up into a tree to get a glimpse of Jesus. He was breaking up his fallow ground. He was doing something he'd never done before, never thought he could. So when was the last time you did something that you had never done before as it, as it relates to Jesus calling you? Can you remember that time where you heard God's voice and you said, oh, I can do that. I'm going to do that. So here's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus said, me? Climb a tree? I mean, I think these kids probably could tell us the story of Zacchaeus. He was a little bitty guy. But he was curious. He wanted to find Jesus. He didn't want, want to know what all the commotion was about. So it's, because he was so small and he couldn't see above the crowd, what did he do? He, he climbed the tree, didn't he? Remember that story? So he did something unusual, something he probably had never thought he would do. <clears throat> and then there's Nicodemus. So Nicodemus went to Jesus by night. He was breaking up his fallow ground. He was getting out of his rut. He was coming down from his high horse and admitting his need. How about the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair? She was getting out of her rut, breaking up the dry ground of her sinned, sick heart, finding fresh air and a new life. When Andrew and Peter and James and John went down to the Jordan River to hear the message of John the Baptist, they were doing something to break up the fallow ground of their dull religious lives, and they met Jesus, and so will we. All the people who, who stay alive with the flame of God's life have this in common. They don't wait for circumstances to come and beat them on the head. They disrupt their own apathy and start sowing the seed of righteousness and reaping the fruit of mercy. They begin breaking up the fallow ground by learning to pray. I'll pause. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments, anything that anybody wants to say? John. So what this is really saying to me is <clears throat> we bump along through life like this and all of a sudden something may happen that gets our attention. And we have to say, is that you, Lord? Are you speaking to me? Are you saying something to me? Um, because in many ways, we're fat, dumb, and happy. We really are. There's something about pleasure. There's something about these things. And God is really speaking to us, and he continues to speak to us and call us. And so uh, Hosea was talking about this ground that had been tamped down, no longer producing anything, They're just un unworthy ground. And he's talking to, um, uh, to the Israelites to say, it's now time to change. Time to make a change. You want to say something? To me, one thing that I'm just now going through. I grew up in church and I used to pray. And it's like doing the motion, praying, I'm done, I made God happy, I mm -hmm. did my things. It was fine. Uh, things change after a while. I'm so sorry. One more time, brother. It's my fault. Uh, <clears throat> 
talking about the prayer and the disenchantment and crisis, uh, I grew up in a church, and uh, since I was young, I used to pray. And uh, pray, knowing that that way, God, I did my part for you, and I am in a good relationship, good standing with you. And uh, things changed, but about five years ago, we found out that my wife, she has a tumor, uh, a stomach tumor. And then, like you said, that was a crisis for us. And I woke, I started to wake up in the night and to go in another room and pray and pray and say, God, I need your word. And what I realized, God is answering. Many times as Christians we pray, even we don't expect answers from God, just making him happy because we pray. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that God is interested to talk to us. Mm-hmm. And he's like a father, better than a good father, willing to, to embrace us and to start a relationship with us. But sometimes we need crisis to wake up for those. Now, my wife had the surgery three days ago, three days ago and was another incredible news that we have. God is great. Praise him. When you contrast your prayer life, when you are in trouble and when you are surrounded by circumstances that, that um, you wonder how this is all going to turn out, it's so interesting how different our prayers are versus <clears throat> when, the, when, when the road is smooth and when things are going your way and there doesn't seem to be any of that, any, any crisis, the crisis is over, we sort of go back to where we were. We're back to normal. So. I think that's what this is. And so this next section, um, and I'm sure this church is very familiar with Revelation because uh, in the book of Revelation, the first four or five chapters is about certain churches that think they have it all together, that everything's just fine. And so the prophecy here with, uh, that John wrote Um, He spoke to that particular sentiment. And so this is from Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the name of being alive and you are dead. Awake and strengthen what remains and is not and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep that and repent. If you will not awake, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour. I will come upon you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who conquers shall be clad thus in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He, ha- he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In this prophetic word, which is addressed to us, as clearly as the church at Sardis, we are told specifically what to do to break up our follow ground. First, wake up. Awake and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. We need to continuously wake up and see what's happening to us. Open Open your eyes and see how you've allowed whole areas of your life to grow follow. We are not what our spiritual reputation may seem to say we are. We are alive only to the extent we are walking and talking with the living God now. We are alive only to the extent that we are in such communion with the Son of God 
that we are doing his will of mercy now. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of God. What, is the, what does he mean? That they're not wholehearted. They're not genuine. I have found them fallow, half-baked, mindless, listless. Wake up. Sometimes that's a hard message to hear. Second, remember. Remember then what you received and heard. Remember what those fallow fields once were and are already meant to be. Remember the life God gave you. God gave you his son to be your Savior, your Lord, your friend. God gave you his spirit to be your comforter, your guide forever. God gave you his peace, which passes all understanding. God gave you a gospel to proclaim. God gave you a life to live. You received all of this. Hang on to it. Remember. Remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Third, repent. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep that and repent. The person who is willing to repent, to turn gratefully toward God every day, every hour, will continuously be breaking up his fallow ground. Repentance is not just feeling sorry every time you spill the milk. Repentance is making changes in your ways so that you don't spill the milk all the time. Repentance is turning your life and getting it back on course. Fourth, to break up your fallow ground is to conquer. He who conquers shall be clad thus in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Conquer. Overcome. You don't survive in this kingdom of death by wrapping yourself up in religious plastic and hiding in some isolated religious community. You survive in this kingdom of death by conquering death, overcoming death in your mind and body and spirit. The fallow ground in your life is death. Conquer it. But you say, how? First, conquer that fallow ground with a continuous pursuit of the face of God. First of all, in prayer. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God, Christ Jesus. That's in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Paul is getting older, but he isn't getting stale. He's pursuing the best God offers. He's pressing on toward the prize. Press on. Pursue. There is something better than you have now waiting for you up ahead. Go get it. Two. Conquer the follow, the follow ground with a continuous exercising of the spirit over the flesh, continuously choosing to be a woman or man of God instead of a vegetable. Only through prayer can we conquer the fleshly self through the Spirit's power. 
So, when bre- so then, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for it is you, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put a, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that's Romans 8. There's nothing morbid about crucifying the flesh with its afflictions and lusts. It's actually exhilarating and life-giving. What people put themselves through at a fitness center to get an inch off their waist, the diets we suffer in order to take off five pounds, how much more liberating to train the flesh again and again to yield to the merciful, self-giving, self-spending will of God. To say yes to God and no to sloth. Yes to God and no to lust. Yes to God and no to greed. Yes to God and no to gluttony. Yes to God and no to vanity. Yes to God and no to cowardice. Three. Conquer the follow ground by the continuous exercising of the mind. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Be babes in evil, but in thinking be mature. 1 Corinthians 14. Think. There are Christians who seem to believe that it's sinful to think. That thinking is the enemy of faith. There is no way you're going to follow Jesus Christ out there in in that world if you don't use your mind. How are you going to understand what the will of God is? How are you going to redeem the time? How are you going to to be aware of false prophets? How are you going to test the spirits? How are you going to understand the meaning of the guidance you've already been given unless you think. Some of the most fallow ground in Christendom is in the mind. God help us to start plowing, sowing, and cultivating. You break up your fallow ground. Those who wait around for God to break up their fallow ground for, for them will eventually be allowed to remain fallow forever. If you want to live and not rot, we need to learn to keep ourselves alert, alive, and awake. In God, by praying this, praying with life and living what we pray. So sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, For it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain salvation upon you. So I want to close tonight, my part at least, by showing you a video. And one of the things that I believe in deeply is vision, having a vision. And I have thought from the minute I walked into this church a year and a half ago, <clears throat> what a blessed place this is. And so I've, this, is a, this is a pastor that I follow. He's in Portland. But um, I think he summarizes in the most beautiful way what we're trying to do when we're trying to learn how to pray, specifically for God to move in what ways, we need him to move and to, and to provide for us this sort of healthy environment where we can love each other and we can help each other and we can encourage each other and we can be a part of what God is doing. So I'm going to um, ask my friend up in the... You ready? The same spirit who brings peace to your internal chaos also sends you out as a peacemaker into the city. The spirit of peace is also the spirit of peacemaking. These two work together. 
And over the course of the first 30 years, the 120-person church formed in Acts 2 floods the Roman Empire with such overwhelming life that the empire falls to its knees, not before power, but before love. How does that happen? I mean, not just in a fairy tale, but in an actual city with actual people and systems and, and social norms and processes and, and power pools. How does that happen in real lives in a real city? The powerfully healed become powerful healers. That's how it happens. How does the Spirit empower mission? Not through our gifts or our strengths, but through our wounds. It would be a mistake of us to glorify the early church. They were nothing special. As they began to gain a bit of momentum, the Roman government did an investigation into this new sect, and the report is recorded in Acts 4. When they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They weren't particularly intelligent, compelling, attractive, or qualified. They were unschooled and ordinary. But they were filled with the same spirit that filled Jesus. And our liberation is in their commonness, not their giftedness. The scandal of the early church wasn't their gifting. It was their commonness. It was that common people, powerfully healed, become powerful healers. How could Peter stand up, lead a revolution in front of authorities that were threatening his death when he cowered at the social exclusion of a teenage girl a couple of weeks ago because the powerfully healed become powerful healers? How about Mary Magdalene? How on earth could a once demonically demon-possessed woman become a pillar of a movement that took birth in a thoroughly patriarchal society because the powerfully healed become powerful healers? And how could uncommon, eloquent prayers from the lips of ordinary people actually heal bodies and make the disabled stand up and even the dead to rise? The powerfully healed became powerful healers. And how could a spirituality that is built on on the public execution of a mostly overlooked peasant become the most stunning sociological move in the history of the world any way you measure it because the powerfully healed became powerful healers. The Holy Spirit is not an escape from the suffering of this world, but a way to come alive in the midst of the chaos. There's this old uh, fable in the Jewish Talmud of a rabbi uh, who goes to the prophet Elijah and asks, Elijah, when is the Messiah going to come? And Elijah says, why don't you just go ask him for himself, for yourself? And the rabbi responds, where is he? He's sitting right there at the gates of the city. Well, how am I going to pick him out from the crowd of all the other people at the gates? And Elijah says this, he is sitting among the poor, covered with wounds. That's who God is. He is the wounded healer, to borrow a phrase from Henry Nouwen. See, the scandal of Jesus wasn't his power, it's his wounds. It's by his stripes we are healed. He held together supernatural power and the loving power of a a God in the most consequential suffering that we face in the midst of this world. He's a wounded healer. He held that together in one body. And the scandal of the early church wasn't their success. It was their wounds, their commonness. And the scandal of the Holy Spirit isn't power. If there is a God, a creator to be made known, we can assume power is a part of the equation. The scandal is the power of God hidden away in wounded people. See, the thing that makes you an excellent candidate to be used by God, it's not your gifting, it's your wounds. The thing that makes us excellent candidates to rewrite the story of our city through love is not our gifting or qualification or ideas, it's our wounds, it is our commonness. Brennan Manning writes, anyone God uses significantly is always deeply wounded. We are each and every one of us insignificant people whom God has called and graced to use in a significant way. On the last day, Jesus will look us over not for medals, diplomas, or honors, but for scars. Are you common and wounded? Wow. (laughs) What a start. God's not looking for people who have it figured out. And there aren't any spells or techniques to master. By the Spirit, the powerfully healed become powerful healers. And the most powerful healing that comes from your life will always come from your healed wounds. By His wounds we are healed, and by our wounds we join in the healing of the world. 
See, the Holy Spirit means that the chronically anxious can become a non-anxious presence in the midst of your high-strung workplace pouring life into the Dead Sea. And it means that the addicted can become a safe harbor for others who are looking to find freedom. And it means the depressed can be filled with incomprehensible joy and then give that away. That the insecure can become courageous, inviting people into the very life that they previously hid. And the quick-tempered can be flooded with self-control so that their transformation is part of the healing for those that they've previously wronged. And it goes on and on like this in every variety imaginable. Soren Kierkegaard says, with the help of the thorn in my foot, I jump higher than any man with two sound feet.